Thanks to you all for coming on such a foul night. Um, I introduced the very first biodiversity seminar lecture, which was David Suzuki in 2005. And it feels extraordinary to be here uh, now uh, giving this uh, talk myself. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the things that uh, I have worked on and some of the ideas that have motivated the work that I've done over the years. Um, and I will talk a little bit about these um, marvelous fish, three-spined stickleback. So this is, a, this is a male father. He's looking after those little, um, those little youngsters floating around. This is a, a, a male of the benthic species from Paxton Lake, about which you'll hear more. The diversity of life on Earth is breathtaking. I can think of nothing more interesting to have happened in the universe since the Big Bang. To appreciate biodiversity, we need only go for a walk in the woods, just Pacific Spirit Park next to us, and uh, stand there and enjoy the, the beauty of and the complexity of the shapes and the colors and the sizes of things. Smell the woods, listen to the sounds of birds. And um, after a while doing this, you'll begin to feel restored. Um, but also curious, what, what are we looking at? So uh, flip open your phone, take pictures, and send them to iSeq. And you will learn that there are species. So there's a Douglas fir and a western red cedar, western hemlock, Pacific willow, red alder, down on the left soil. A question I want to pose today is why? How and why are there so many species? Where do they come from? How did they get here? One part of this question is, how do they persist as distinct entities all in the same place? Why don't they all collapse down into a single species? A little later on, I'll show you that sometimes they do. But for the most part, species don't collapse because they don't interbreed. They're all sexually active in this photograph, um, but uh, they mate true to kind, and they, they don't... Um, they either don't mate, or should they cross-pollinate, the offspring will have reduced viability or fertility. And this feature, this relationship between populations um, uh, and, and species is something that we call reproductive isolation. I wish I had a better term for you, but I couldn't find a better one. So I study uh, speciation, the origin of species. And uh, my concern, therefore, is the evolution of reproductive isolation. Now, it might sound a little obvious that they don't interbreed. <clears throat> you took that for granted to begin with, but reproductive isolation is very crucial. Because two forms that are evolving into separate species, once the flow, once the movement of genes from one into the other is, is staunched, each will have its own separate evolutionary fate, even if they all inhabit the same place. And with the flow of genes between them staunched, in time they will be able to accumulate all of the interesting differences in size, shape, color, and smell that you witness every time you go out for a walk in the woods. The result of this ongoing process of a single species splitting and becoming two, and then happening uh, again and again, has given rise to all of the major um, biodiversity patterns that we see today across the globe. So this process of speciation is a, is a very fundamental one to the, the origin of biodiversity. Right. I should remember to change the slides. A related problem, a related problem is where are all these species? Where do they, do they end up? Where does speciation actually happen? And uh, I'm um, very, very interested in the relationship between 
speciation and where species occur um, across the Earth. And if someone were to ask me, where do most species occur on Earth, I'd say to a reasonable approximation, they're all in the tropics. So this is a, a heat map for birds. And hot colors are areas of the world where the numbers of bird species present uh, is really high. And green are areas of the world where the number of bird species is very low. And uh, as I was preparing the slide, I looked up at my bookshelf, and it's obvious. The birds of Ecuador is this great big, fat, heavy book, and the birds of Europe is this slim, <laughs> reduced thing that you could fit in your pocket. And um, if you go to the tropics, you'll notice that this pattern is true not just for birds, but for many other groups of or organisms. If you open up these bird guides and look at, say, hummingbirds, on the left, you see all of the hummingbirds of Canada. On the right, you see the hummingbird species that are present in Ecuador, which is a tiny country uh, on the uh, west coast of South America. It's staggering how many hummingbird species there are. <clears throat> so why these patterns occur, how they evolved, uh, is uh, an enduring question. And it's not going to be my main question today. What I want to do is ask something about its relationship to the origin of species. And I work on fishes, so I have to have a fish slide as well. So again, another heat map of the globe, and where you see hot colors, that's where the diversity of um, marine fishes is highest. And cold colors, you are here, uh, is where the diversity of marine fi uh, fishes is comparatively low. So like marine fishes, like birds, like mammals, like just about every group of organisms you can name, there are more species in the tropics than the temperate zone. And it was long thought that one of the explanations for this is that, well, the tropics are hotter, everything's faster there, more mutations, evolution's faster. And um, recently we have been able to actually measure the rate at which new species form across the globe. And for marine fishes, it looks like this. So on the left is the graph I just showed, the heat map, where, uh, indicating where uh, species diversity of marine fishes is highest. But on the right, hot colors represent those areas of the world where the rate at which new species are forming is highest. Then the cold colors are the air regions of the world where the rate at which new species are forming is slowest. It's the opposite pattern. The temperate zone. The cold waters of the world are the, the hotbed of speciation. Canada, not Southeast Asia. Um, what are these rapidly speciating fishes? Well, maybe you recognize some of them. This is the China rockfish. So, so the, there's, a, there's a great burst of fairly young species of rockfish off the Pacific coast here. And it's one of the groups that contributes to this pattern. Uh, and this pattern's now been shown. Um, my student, Jason Weir, showed it first for birds and mammals. It's been found for many um, um, plant groups as well. So if you love nature, and I do, and you want to see a lot of species go to the tropics, but if you want to be where the rate at which new species are evolving is highest, come back. Regions of the world where new species are forming rapidly is a great place to work. There are many advantages to, well, not just being young, but working on young species. So there's a couple of pictures from my uh, Galapagos years. And the advantage of working on young species is that they can hopefully tell us something about how they formed. So as a, as, a, as a young man, I had the, the good fortune to spend uh, almost two years on the Galapagos. This is the island of, of Pinta, where we set up camp. There's, a, there's a, a, a feeble radio tower there, but it didn't work. We, uh, um, we would take a boat out, uh, be dropped off onto this island, myself and one, one other person. And we would be out there for like five months. A boat would come once a month, and otherwise we'd have absolutely no 
contact with the rest of the world. I was 22 years old, <coughs> and prior to that trip, I had never been further south than Boston. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. We had to bring all our water with us, all our food with us, because the islands are dry. And uh, yeah, one boat per month to bring uh, fresh <laughs> eggs uh, and, and mail, and also water. Uh, I don't think we're allowed to do this to our graduate students anymore. <laughs> uh, but, but it was astounding, just, just, to, just to, to be there. It's, it's been estimated roughly that across the tree of life, the amount of time it takes for a single species, when it begins to split, to eventually for the descendant forms to become separate species, is about two million years. But uh, the Galapagos represents an exception in the tropics in that um, the youngest species there are on the order of 200,000, 300,000 years old. So an order of magnitude younger. Um, I currently work on uh, three spine stickleback, as I mentioned. And uh, they have um, certain advantages. One of them is they're, they're local, but the, the real um, thing that drew my attention to them is that they include, um, in small coastal lakes of British Columbia, some of the youngest species on Earth in anything, any organism. Most of the diversity is in fresh water, and the marine uh, and, uh, stickleback, which is the ancestor of all the freshwater forms, uh, is still swimming in uh, coastal areas. If you go down to Granville Island in the fall and look down at the docks where that little ferry is, you'll see big schools of uh, marine three-spine stickleback. Most small uh, coastal lakes of British Columbia have um, stickleback. Most of them have just one species. So this is uh, Cranby Lake, one of the places that we work, on uh, Texada Island, which is uh, uh, close to Powell River. And to understand how they got there, what started them off, uh, we have to start here about 13,000 years ago, at which time where we're sitting today, there, there was about a mile, uh, a mile of ice, a mile of ice deep. And um, this ice was very, very heavy. And it was so heavy that it pushed coastal lands uh, it squished coastal lands into the sea. And uh, Derek Tan has created uh, a, a video for me to illustrate what happened subsequently as the ice retreated. So the ice melted. <coughs> and uh, in this area, we're getting a, sort of a side view of the ice melting and retreating. And uh, with the weight of the ice removed, the land uh, rebounded. It took about a thousand years. And bays became uh, lagoons, became lakes. And marine stickleback um, colonized these lakes and are still there today. And as they did so, and after they did so, they um, adapted to those, uh, to those lake environments. And uh, what really drew my uh, interest in the group is that some lakes actually have two species of three-spine stickleback. And we call them the benthic species and the limnetic species to draw attention to their very um, conspicuous ecological differences. Uh, so they occur only in a few small lakes, five, and um, they're present nowhere else in the world, and these lakes are only 10, 12,000 years old. So that puts a timeline on just how fast these, um, these forms have evolved. So as I said, they're ecologically different. One is sort of heavier, um, larger, well, they're, they're only this big, but comparatively, the, the, the deeper-bodied, <coughs> downturned mouth and feeds on invertebrates uh, in the sediments and uh, the edges, whereas the limnetic species is a, is a sleek, slender form that feeds out in the open water on invasive zooplankton. So how do new species form? How did these new species form? To, um, to answer, we have to start with Darwin who uh, called this problem The Mystery of Mysteries. So this is an amazing book. It gets my vote for the best book ever written. Um, and uh, n not only because it changed the way we think of 
ourselves, but to the um, but to the scientist in me, it it established the theoretical framework for all of biology. Its usefulness has not waned since 1859 when it was published, and instead it's the opposite. As biology has developed and grown as a science, the importance of this book and the ideas in this book have only grown. So Darwin proposed that new species arise by natural selection. This is his great, brilliant idea. Um, now, what is natural selection, you might ask? Well, we all know now what natural selection is because we all had a ringside seat over the last couple of years watching it happen and, and happen in fast motion. So this is a, a graph of different um, major variants of COVID that arose and became more frequent and then became less frequent as they were replaced by yet another variant. So the past couple of years, one variant has um, become better able to evade our immune system and become better able at being transmitted to infect new individuals. And then another variant would arise that was even better at doing the very same thing. And then another one would arise that would do the very same thing. That's natural selection. One form deterministically increasing at the expense of another <coughs> uh, as a result of characteristics like um, being able to overcome immune systems and, and uh, uh, become transmitted. So natural selection in fishes and in uh, sexual organisms generally is a lot like this, except in the case of COVID, um, entire variants increase in frequency and then, and then go as they are replaced by another one. But in the case of um, fishes and other sexual organisms, the variants arise at the individual genes. And because the genome is reshuffled every uh, generation, uh, variants of individual genes can increase together. But otherwise, the process looks pretty much the same. So in thinking about how new species form, um, Darwin and others scratched their heads and thought, how can natural selection favor an inability to interbreed? How can natural selection favor the production of less fit offspring? How can natural selection favor individuals not mating with half of the population? And uh, the answer we now know is it doesn't. At least it does not do so directly. Reproductive isolation, this property possessed by species, this, this property that defines them, um, evolves incidentally as populations adapt. The origin of new species is a side effect of genetic changes that occur for other reasons. I'm going to try, try to show you how this works, how we think it works. Now, Darwin had no knowledge of genes whatsoever although he was contemporaneous <clears throat> with Mendel. Genes, uh, knowledge of genes didn't come until the early 1900s, but I like to think that if Darwin did know about genes, he would have explained speciation like this. So imagine who, um, two hypothetical genes, A and B, Alice and Bob. In an ancestral population, uh, the variants or the... the, the um, the forms that are present, I'm just going to call little a and little b. And, and in this case, this population that we're tracking over time is in a new environment. And at some point in this new environment, uh, a variant pops up that I'm going to call big A. And I'm going to call it green because it looks like fresh water. And uh, because this gene causes the individuals bearing it to have an advantage. They feed a little better. They can tolerate fresh water a little better. That eventually replaces A in exactly the same way that you saw variants replacing variants. 
Then eventually at the second gene, the Bob gene, uh, another variant occurs, capital E. Uh, and it too provides its bearers with an advantage, a survival or a reproductive advantage. And so eventually this population evolves to uh, become at those two genes, big A and big B. Whereas meanwhile, in a second population, which remains in the ancestral environment, uh, not much is happening. Simply as a consequence of these genetic changes, it is possible, and it has happened, <coughs> that they are less likely to recognize one another as mates by virtue of their genetic differences. Maybe, the, maybe A causes a change in color. And maybe when mates choose mates, they look at color, or they look at size, or they look at other features. And if those features have changed, then that will affect the the probability that they mate when they finally encounter one another again. Or another possibility is that um, when a hybrid is produced, if they do mate with one another and produce offspring, a malfunction occurs. That malfunction occurs between big B and little a, which have never before in the history of this sequence of changes been together in the same individual. And when they do, uh, they don't work. They don't talk to each other. Genes communicate with genes, and if that breaks down, then it has consequences. So selection doesn't favor the origin of species um, directly. It happens incidentally. And I wouldn't say accidentally, because even though the mutations are random, the genetic changes are guided by natural selection. Highly deterministic process. Nothing random about it. But there's a lot of questions. This is just a, a cartoon of how we think it works, but how does it really work? How do you decide whether this is the correct view of the world? And people like me, therefore, go out and study systems like Stickleback in order to ask questions like, well, if natural selection was guiding the origin of species in this system, how would we know? So one of the things that we did on this system, in this, uh, these, these small lakes on Texada Island and other Gulf Islands, is to um, look at all of the differences between these species in size and shape and color and the, the, sh the orientation of the mouth and, and ask, does it matter? So I mentioned that one of them feeds primarily inshore and on the sediments, and the other one's out, out in the open water feeding on zooplankton. What if we forced them to, um, to grow and feed in each other's habitats? So we can do transplant experiments. So we build enclosures in the lake, we float them out in the open water, we sink them in the inshore, and then we do reciprocal transplant experiments. And these experiments show that uh, each of the species has the advantage in its usual habitat. And uh, we've also shown that the main, con the main reason for this is that they're just better at acquiring food resources there by virtue of all of the adaptations of the head and mouth and uh, fins that they, that they possess and that distinguish them. The second thing that we looked at, a second thing that we looked at, was the repeatability of this process of divergence. Uh, one, of the, one of the marvelous discoveries of this uh, system is that benthic and limnitic species are found in um, five different uh, lakes or lake systems. Um, and the molecular data that uh, has been analyzed uh, shows that each of these has formed independently of one another that repeatedly a benthic form has evolved in a lake and repeatedly a limnetic form has evolved in a lake in those lakes where, uh, which were invaded uh, twice and where uh, both forms managed to persist until now. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable when evolution repeats itself. And it's uh, clearly also not random. Natural selection is the only known process in nature that can guide repeatedly the same or similar outcome. But what really got us interested in is the 
the third series of studies that we did in which we asked whether reproductive isolation itself was repeatable. And the answer is yes. So even though these forms, benthic and limnetic, have evolved repeatedly in different lakes, what happens if you take a male limnetic from Enos Lake and put him with a, a female from Paxton Lake? Will they mate? Absolutely. But if you take a, a benthic, uh, and if you take a benthic from Enos Lake and, and um, put him together with a, a, a benthic female from Paxton Lake, will they mate? Yes, they will. Almost as readily as a male and a female from the very same lake. Uh, uh, from the same population. But if you place a benthic male with a lunetic female, will they mate? No, they will not. Oops. So what this means is that not only have size, shape, color, behaviors evolved repeatedly, independently in different lakes, so have the traits that govern who prefers to mate with whom. That reproductive isolation has itself evolved independently over and uh, over again. So to have evolution repeat itself is amazing, but to have the origin of the species happen repeatedly is, I think, astounding and also a very strong signal that natural selection is somehow guiding this process. Now we also have some idea now as to why, how, how, this, how, this, can, how this can happen. And, um, what we've discovered is that uh, stickleback already have a sort of built-in behavior mechanism, an ancient one, that uh, causes them to prefer to mate with other individuals that are just like themselves. So they have some way of judging who they are, what they look like, or at least where they feed and what their size is, and uh, to prefer to mate with other individuals that are just like that. And so as they became different in size and shape and all those characteristics, their mating preferences diverged accordingly. Now what we're trying to do is uh, understand better the genetic changes that were, were, were produced mm -hmm. by natural selection that, that underlie all these size, shape, behavior, and mating preference differences. And then we've been doing this uh, using uh, an experimental pond facility that we have here on um, UBC campus. <clears throat> so um, we're looking at a, 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 an aerial view of the pond facility or part of it. And for scale, this group of people here is me and my lab. So they're, they're a reasonable, uh, reasonable scale, 25 meters by 15 meters, and um, they're six meters deep in one, uh, at one end. And uh, the idea behind this, uh, this facility is that it allows us to measure um, natural behaviors, so behaviors of, of stickleback and hybrids in a, in a natural setting. So they behave as they would if they were in the wild. Um, now, I'm not going to take you through uh, any details of the, what, what we've learned about um, the genes themselves, but as a consequence of um, genetic work on uh, stickleback and genome sequences, uh, I want to tell you about a couple of things that we've learned that surprised us. Here's two pairs of, of, uh, of uh, uh, stickleback, one from Paxton Lake and one from Priest Lake. And um, I've taken w one of the genes that um, differentiate them. Here, I'll call it A, since we're familiar with it. Um, so imagine that uh, what, what, we've, what we found is that um, when we look at the, the differences between um, the limnetic and the, the benthic, we find that the same genes are involved in different species pairs. Not only that, but the variants at those genes are very similar. In fact, the big A variant that characterizes the benthic in this lake 
is very similar to the big A variant that characterizes the benthic in this lake. It's more similar, these two are more similar to each other than this variant is to the little a. What that means is that um, big A variant at this gene and at thousands of genes did not arise as a new variant within each lake independently. Instead, it must have been brought to the lake by the marines that colonized it 10,000 years ago. And if we look in the marine population today, we can actually find copies of Big A, suggesting that that's not unreasonable. The second thing that surprised us was that even though it is true that Big A arose from Little A, it did so more than a million years ago. The average age we estimate to be about two million years ago was when the Big A variant arose from the Little A variant. How is this possible? It means that the Big A variant is older than the lakes. It means it's older than the species. No, there is no stickleback population in the world that's two million years old. We have no source population for big A, or at least no, no, no population that's two million years old that we could go and see if A arose there. Instead, here's what we think. We think that old variants like Big A kick around, that they're kept in circulation for millions of years by the movement of genes between freshwater and marine populations, which probably have existed for millions of years. Just none of the old ones are around anymore. So Derek made a video that attempts to illustrate what we think has gone on. So once again, the ice, the ice recedes, and um, let's go back, colonize um, fresh water. So let's just look at it in the case of a single species. Somewhere south of the glaciers, somewhere long ago in the, in, in the past, perhaps, um, a marine stickleback mated with a freshwater stickleback, and I'm using the green color of the big A to illustrate that this offspring is sort of half and half, and each stripe refers to a, a, a different gene. And this hybrid then joins the marine population, mates with it, and produces offspring that also carry copies, but a, a lesser number. Generation after generation of uh, reproduction in the sea produces more offspring, and uh, the freshwater genome, all of these genes which were present in the original freshwater uh, individual that mated with the marine, this sort of disintegrates and becomes scattered throughout uh, the marines in the, um, in, the, in the sea, where we might find them even today. Later on, further north, the ice recedes, the lakes are colonized by freshwater, and the marines bring copies of these genes, these old genes with them. And uh, over time, uh, offspring are produced, some of which have more of the genes that have A, B, C, D, and E, not just A. Uh, and uh, those individuals that have more of the freshwater type gene um, variants are more likely to survive. And so gradually, over time, natural selection recreates a freshwater population, which is almost like the freshwater population that was the source of the alleles further to the south. I want to talk about two other aspects of modern species. There's a downside to having so much biodiversity made up of species that are very young, which is uh, true of Canada. And that is that many of these uh, species are persisting in a, in a balance between 
the occasional production of hybrids between them, and limetics and benthics do produce some hybrids. And then the removal of those hybrids the, by, by, by virtue of their reduced survival or reduced fertility. And so these populations have persisted for 10,000 years in this balance. But when environments change, that balance can change. And the result is not the usual, oh, species go extinct when the environment changes. What happened in, uh, in the case of the uh, stickleback species pair in Enos Lake was that what was formerly two species collapsed again into uh, a single species. Uh, and uh, so you can see that um, in 1977 there were two clusters shown in uh, red and blue, and those clusters represent different um, uh, individuals that are uh, similar to one another in the, in the, that belong to the same cluster but different from the other clusters. So it takes a lot of traits and tries to represent them in just two dimensions. Nearby points are similar in shape, distant points are farther apart and uh, are more different in shape. 1988, still two clusters. 1977, still two-ish clusters, but the clusters are becoming more similar. By the year 2000, the species pair was gone. And what remains is a, is a, a, a hybrid. Um, as I mentioned, there are only five species pairs have been discovered, and now only three remain. So Enos Lake is extinct, and the one on the Skidi Island is also gone. They are all uh, uh, currently recognized as endangered species. A second aspect of modern species is the, the, the flip side. There's, there's now a new source of biodiversity on the block. We can make new species now. It's possible. And uh, this was a study that was um, uh, published that uh, showed how it could be done and did it using fruit flies. And in doing this, <clears throat> they took a page from the very hypothesis that uh, I, um, I showed uh, earlier for how um, new species might accumulate differences that then cause hybrids to malfunction. And uh, sort of quickly, they, they worked with two genes, Alice and Bob, and uh, they created synthetic variants, big A and big B, at those two genes. So gene A, gene A is a control switch. It turns on other, another gene, which is very vital. It turns it on, turns it off at various stages in development. And that allows uh, a, a fly egg to become an embryo, to become a fly. They created synthetic variant B that tells A never to turn off. However, synthetic variant A is resistant to big B. So they basically created uh, the variant A and then the, the variant B and created this new population that was different at those two uh, genes. And when these two forms were hybridized, the hybrid malfunctioned because big B turned on little a, never to turn it off. And uh, the result was that the product produced by A never j just accumulated to toxic levels and then killed the embryo. So two species, two forms, genetically different, cannot interbreed. I do like to think about what synthetic speciation might tell us about the origin of natural species, even by its contrast. You know, in this particular example of synthetic speciation, reproductive isolation was the goal. But in natural speciation, reproductive isolation is incidental and generally involves many more than two genes. And these new species are accumulating at a very fast rate. There's all kinds of synthetic forms being produced in laboratories um, around the world. And, and uh, I think that if we 
count species some hundred years from now, we'll probably discover that a, a fairly large number of them are uh, to be found in labs around the world. And I hope that's where they stay. These new species are hardly majestic. I would not call them so. A walk through the lab will not be nearly so restorative as a walk through the woods. I doubt this is biodiversity's uh, feature, but we better make sure we take care of our natural species as well. One of the reasons lo uh, why I love working on uh, stickleback is that, and, and uh, why I regard them as so uh, precious, is that by their variety, their youth, and by their possessing so many forms and so many intermediate forms, that they have managed to preserve not just species, but also the processes that gave rise to them. And um, I thought I would close then with a, a quote from my hero. Uh, Darwin, this is actually the last uh, paragraph of his book, and uh, is um, my favorite passage in all of literature. And uh, one, one that inspires me no matter uh, how many times I read it. And uh, the reason is that, it, to me, it captures not just the, the beauty of biodiversity and all the wonderful interactions that take place, but also because it captures the thrill that comes from thinking about Darwin's great idea and how it can be applied to uh, guide our understanding of how biodiversity arose in the, in the first place and how it persists. So it's interesting to contemplate an entangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. There is grandeur in this view of life, which I believe, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Thank you.